Hello, welcome to the world of Word. Coming up, another word in your attic. And if you enjoy this, visit our Patreon to find out more about our exclusives and our general work of national importance. The link is in the notes below. And now, on with the show. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Welcome to another edition of We're in Your Attic, and uh, how very, very delightful to see the incredibly smartly dressed uh, and very fabulous multi-instrumentalist Terry Edwards, an old pal of us, who you'll know from his work with, uh, with Madness and Tom Waits and the Blockheads, and Hot Chip and, and Nick Cave and tons of others over the last 40 years, including recently the, the PJ Harvey Band uh, record, recording and touring. Terry, it's great to see you. Actually, give us, first of all, a list of the, the instruments provided by the Terry Edwards <laughs> one-man service. Give us a full list. Okay. Um, guitar, keyboard, saxophone, trumpet, flugelhorn. Um, if you've got a really good temperament, you might get a note out of a trombone from me. Um, my midlife crisis out, um, instrument was the flute. Uh, I got the one of them when I was 50 because I could never get <laughs> out of it before. But uh, uh, yes, so uh, is that enough? Yeah, that's, 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 enough. that's very, very impressive. Incredible. And where, where, are we, where, where do we find you? Where are you, where are you now? Uh, you find me in the East End of London in sunny Whitechapel. And you're very smartly dressed for some reason, Terry. Is that your normal attire? There's no way expect of a musician in the morning. Uh, no, and uh, I didn't know that there was a 9.30 in the morning until <laughs> yeah. we asked to do this. <clears throat> But um, all the so musicians I, we talk to say exactly the same thing. <laughs> all the authors are having lunch. All the musicians are going, what time do you call this? Um, when I did some solo John Peel sessions, um, having done five for the Higsons and various other people, I, I thought that it might be a lovely idea to dress for the radio. So um, it struck me that uh, I know that we're, we are being filmed here and everything, but right, this right. is a podcast and people can listen to it and not see you, I suppose, I guess. Is that oh, they get, we can do it all kinds of ways, all kinds yeah. of ways. Um, so I live around the corner from the sadly closed at the moment Whitechapel Bell Foundry. And, I, and they used to sell Bell Foundry ties. So oh. the insignia. Oh, really? Is the, 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 White, the Whitechapel Bell Foundry. Extraordinary. Yeah. That's lovely. That's the, Very the insignia for it. So I got the, the musicians who didn't want to wear ties because why would you wear anything while you're recording a radio session that nobody can see? Um, but I got everyone to, to wear a, a Whitechapel Bell Foundry tie. So Terry, first traditional and question. I take it off, actually. Oh, take it off by all means. You're looking at me now. Look at that. Yeah, relax. <laughs> That's enough of that. <laughs> That's <Yeah. a> great. <laughs> Um, first traditional question I'm word in your writing is, can you remember uh, what music device, what, what device was playing records in your house when you grew up? Where did you um, hear music? The, the record player, I don't think it was actually a Dan set, but it was. It was one of the, the sort of boxes with a lid, but I don't think make of it was Dan set. It was um, a Philips or a whatever yeah, 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 a generic yeah. kind of thing. So that, that was the, that was it. Um, but also, I mean, my grand grandparents did have a gramophone, and oh, so I listened to what a, wi a wind up, up. an actual yeah. wind up, wind up gramophone. Playing what? Seventy eight. Yeah, yeah. Um, things like uh, Fred and Adele Astaire. So oh, you wow, amazing. Tap, tap dancing on records. It's a, it's a bit like the guy who did ventriloquism on the radio. You know. Absolutely. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> So what happened to that? That disappeared somewhere in the family, did it? You don't um, still have it. I do have. I do have a wind-up gramophone. I oh, really? Microphone, but not that particular one. Right. That was, um, you know the tall bits of furniture that you could store the records underneath. Yeah. Uh, I've, yeah. Got a, I've got a tabletop one, which you know still weighs a ridiculous amount. Right, right, <laughs> right. Wooden thing. Um, and I believe there's a, a company that. Uh, still sets aside a week a year to manufacture needles for these oh, right they just send worldwide they can you know, a steel factory somewhere because people still use wind-up gramophones so. oh that's amazing because we were it's talking about this the other week we, inter we? we interviewed someone who did, put out a book about shellac and 78 it's fascinating actually Incredible. And Which they used, and I are both old enough to remember. Can uh, just about remember. I remember you used to have the needles used to be in the little, little pot. That's right. On the, 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 the top of the corner. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, and you were supposed to, according to uh, whoever we were talking to. Sorry, I've forgotten his name. Do forgive me. Um, 
You use it, ideally you were supposed to use a fresh needle every time every you record. Play. Yeah, apparently so because it would um, uh, the blunt needle would damage the record or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they looked like little ink wells, didn't they? In the back? yeah, absolutely. They did exactly like right. dip, dip your pen, the yeah. pen in there. Yeah, definitely. So have you got some stuff uh, set uh, set by to show and tell? I have uh, indeed. Yes. Where would you like to start? Have you got Have you got the first record you ever bought or anything like that? I do have the first record I ever bought. Oh, good. It's always good. Oh, on the Fontana label. Now. Fontana okay, you have like... to bring it closer to the camera. We can't read that. Oh, well, tell us what it is. The dinked yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, hang on, hang on a sec. Oh, it's Dave D. Dozy. Oh, Thank that's you, terrific. Make a ditch. Fantastic. It's, it's the Legend of Xanadu. The Legend of Xanadu. <laughs> Uh, That's it's a quality 1968, record. which you think, well, some, how old is this man? Um, I, I begged the money from my mum so that I could go up to the shop around the corner, uh, which was an electronic shop, basically. They sold valves and all this. They all were. Stuff. That's exactly right. They were. And the top ten. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who a little uh, bloke, there was always a very little groovy little, uh, bloke in a little kind of booth with, with the records, you know, surrounded by two bar electric fires. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, there was nothing particularly groovy about this establishment. Um, so so where, well, that, whereabouts were you? Where did you grow up? This was Hornchurch in Essex. All oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, and that was on the Hornchurch Road. Yeah. So the Legends of Xanadu remind me, is that the one where he used to crack a whip? You surely I did. I think that's what appealed to the very young me. Yeah. This <laughs> funny little sound, you know, the sound effect kind of thing. The, you know, you'd... You'd like Pinky and Perky or whatever, and the whip cracking sounds and all those sort of, uh, yeah. There used to be a famous record that was often played on children's favourites called Whip Crack Away, was it? Oh, yeah. Yes, Doris Day. Doris Day. It? Doris yes. Day. It's very much that, that kind stage. of idea. Yeah, yeah exactly. Dave D. Dozy, Mick and Titch, when you think about them, are one of the most curious phenomenon in, in popular music, aren't they, really? You know, they slowly lost members, didn't they? Yeah, they, I think so. Uh, do they still play? Is there still Titch abroad or something? Well, I, 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 think I, <laughs> just, I have a feeling. It's just dozy on his own. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think this story might come from Glenn Matlock or somebody who'd, who'd seen these someone on the circuit being Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick and Oh, no, it's somebody who's chatting to, to this guy. He said, oh, yeah, I'm playing Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick and Titch. And his name was Eric or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Glenn or whoever it was who was telling me the story said, um, who are you? Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm Mick. <laughs> a rock, so they took on the name of, of whoever it was they they replaced over the years. They were an extraordinary thing. I mean, they had about eighteen months at the very top, didn't they? they had loads of hit records. They were huge. They were the strangest sight on top of the pops possible, because <laughs> they they looked like they were like forerunners of sweet in that they were all kind of satin, but they looked like brickies, didn't they? You know, <laughs> They could never get away from that, that yeah. side of them. That's a very good first record. Excellent. What else he got there? So also, um, let me see. These aren't in chronological order. No, it's done. No, go on. Good. Okay. This is a, a bizarre artifact. Ooh, you think, ah, oh, what on earth did Terry win that for? <laughs> I'm not even entirely sure I know what it is. Uh, Explain. Well, it's, it's um it, it's the sort of thing that you would uh, win at the local bowls championship. Oh right, no, it's a trophy. No, Sorry, it's a I thought trophy. it was some kind of div massive tin opener or something. It's uh, a trophy. No. Yeah, um, yeah. This this is uh, some sort of motor car on the top of it. Oh yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, um, and there were ten of these items with a different thing on the top for as a trophy for each member. Of PJ Harvey, uh, can you read that? Oh, oh right. Oh, brilliant. So, so PJ Harvey, Fillmore Auditorium, Denver, Colorado, May second, twenty seventeen, and um, they're really shonkily made. It's obviously a fan or somebody, or maybe they always did this at this venue or something. And so I don't know if everyone kept the one that they'd got. You know, well, there'd be a pair of ice skates or something on one of them, and you know, whatever. But I decided to go for the really rather. Awful car. <laughs> so you you got a choice, did you? you, yeah. you there was a yeah. selection. You could pick yeah. one. Yeah. Were you and part I, of the recording in progress project with PJ Harvey? You were, weren't yes, you? When you recorded yeah. the album in a studio and people could go along and watch through that. It, couple it was, of, was in Summerset House. House. That's right. Yeah. yeah. 
What and was it, that like? So you're recording, you've got people literally with their noses pressed to the glass. <laughs> well, you couldn't see them. It was one-way glass. Right. So oh, right. See you and you couldn't see them. You were aware that there'd be people there because the glass was darker if the yeah. place was full. And also, of course, it was timed entry. People got 45 minutes for their ticket. And we all had little um, microphones on. And as soon as the 45 minutes was up, even if we were halfway through something, oh, right. up. So, that, so suddenly the room would go silent, and uh, everyone knew that the, you know, the game was over. It was a bit oh, like... Oh, really? <laughs> Very peculiar. Oh, oh, 66, come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Have you been involved in lots of conversations during lockdown with other musicians about what you might be doing now? You know, new ways to kind of play music, and present yourself, and so forth? I've kind of run away a little bit from that. Oh, um, really? Because I don't... I really don't need to see somebody in their kitchen playing an acoustic guitar. Right. Well, There's been a lot of it, hasn't there? Don't want to go down that road. Not that I'm sort of disparaging anyone who wants no, to. No, 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 sure. And some people are better than others at doing it, let's face it. Yeah. Um, but there, there are some interesting people who have, have come up and done some interesting things. I think it's a matter of trying to get the technology together. Um, as you can tell, I'm really good at that. <laughs> well, no, you do. We've, we've made contact. We had a, a little yeah. blip earlier on, no, viewers, before we were <laughs> trying to get the right yeah. signal, but we've sorted it out now. But Terry, yeah. come on, what else you got in the way of records there? Dig us uh, out uh, another dig us uh, out another disc or item. Uh, another item. Objet de pop. Objet de pop. Okay, um, I'm allowed to sort of pat myself on the back every now and then. Of course you are. Of course. Okay. Pat away. Uh, That's what it's uh, for. Here is your own trumpet. Can Give we see it. this? All right. Uh, I can't read what it says. What's uh, it no, well, I'll, I'll read it to you because it's Go Mike on. Garson. It's Mike oh, Garson right. and David Bowie. Oh, and right. I, and I've done two or three tours with Mike Garson now. Yeah. And he is a phenomenally brilliant musician. He's, he, he really is the one of the best people I've ever played with. He's one of these people who practices, you know? And actually, oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> and okay. I had, no, it's still cheating. to this day. Um, no, he's and he's got a hugely great sense of humour as well. So um, I think that we hit it off quite a lot because you know I'll, I'll just cheekily put in some little Thelonious Monk riff. His ear will pick up and he'll just start hammering away at it halfway through Starman or something right. like that. You know. Right. Um, so this was after one of the um, shows that we'd done at the Pizza Express in Hoban, which. Um, I should be playing at the end of next month, actually, but uh, who knows? Who um, knows? Pizza Express. Go on. And anyway. uh, he just said, for Terry, you are amazing, Mike Garson. And uh, that just fills me up. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> what, how could such a brilliant musician just, just say that? And I said, oh, that, I'm really touched. And he said, well, that's how I felt when I wrote it. <laughs> so you, tell us some more about it. He practices. What does he do? He practices every day like a kind of classical yeah. piano player. Pretty yeah, much. absolutely. Yeah, just to um, in the way that Sonny Rollins did before. Sadly, he had to stop playing. You know, he would just keep. He would practice and practice and practice all these things just in case he got an idea while he was on stage, and he would then know how to play it. <laughs> it's one of those things. Just keeping up the. Um, uh, yeah, keeping your chops up, as we say. Yeah, yeah. And do you find gun kind of rock musicians don't do that? Um, not as much as we should. <laughs> why, do you, why do you think that is? That'd be us. Um, I think it comes in waves a little bit. I, and also, I mean, um, I stupidly made a rod for my own back by playing far too many instruments. <clears throat> so there aren't enough hours in the day to do all of them just No, no, to keep up with all of them. Don't, don't wind, instruments no, have to, have, wind instrument players have to maintain it far more than, than, than guitarists. You do just, you've got to you keep trumpet. your lip in. I mean, if you're a sax trumpet player or something. particularly difficult. The, trump, the muscles you use for the trumpet um, yeah. aren't used for anything else. So if you don't play, then the next time you pick it up, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm 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 not that bad. I do, <laughs> I do I do I do play most days something, but it goes in cycles. So if you're on a tour where you where you're just playing guitar, obviously you're not picking the flute up. You know? No, so, no. I've so got... you then have to sort of regroup, and next time you you do that. But <clears throat> I quite like being an all rounder. I know that I'm I'm not a virtuoso in any of them, but um, I I like being a general practitioner, shall we say? So when you when you get a call. Uh from a band which presumably must do from time to time do you turn up with everything oh uh, no we discuss things first <laughs> okay i gotta say 
<laughs> um, <clears throat> transportation is the other thing. You yes. Know. <laughs> Just lay out an array of instruments and say, <laughs> take your pick. Like yeah, yeah. What would Sir like? A little bit of yeah. trumpet here and a little bit of horn here. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I mean, that, that people do sort of just ask, ask your opinion as well. So I've got this track and I, I want saxophone on it, but I don't know what or something. And you listen to it and you think, well, actually, I think what they really want is something that sounds a bit more like a stax section. Yeah. So I'll bring the trumpet and the tenor. And often those things, a simple two piece section is what they, they may be looking for. Or right. if they just want yeah. the bottom end on it, you just bring the baritone and... You, you work out in advance, you sort of do the arranging. Uh -huh. Are you one of those people who keeps a lot of souvenirs? Not vast amounts, I don't think, but I'm a bit of a hoarder and uh, I've lived in the same place for over 30 years. So you kind of don't tend to throw stuff out if you don't. Right, know. right. He's looking at a man who's got a million records. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's next? What else have you got to show us there? Ah, yes. <clears throat> Very sentimental. Uh, I know drumsticks come up, don't they? I've seen. Oh right! Oh, no, we've had drumsticks, yeah. Drumsticks, um, mm -hmm. not quite lit well enough. This says Charlie Charles on it. Right. Mean anything to you? Not to me. Go no. on, Dave. Go on. No, yeah. go on. The Blockhead drummer. Oh, oh right. right! Yeah, yeah of, course, of course, of course. Yeah. And the late, the late Blockhead yeah. drummer. And un unlike a, a lot of people who've gone and sort of nicked them off people. I caught it when he threw it into the ocean. right, right, <laughs> and like immediately had to sort of hug it to me before anyone nicked it back off me. So, what um, was the gig? Hey, how old were you? Uh, I'd have been eighteen, I think. Yeah. Um, so I'd I'd just got a saxophone for my eighteenth birthday, and I loved Davy Payne, the sax player in the Blockheads. It was him and Earl Bostick that started me off on the on the saxophone thing. And I'm kind of kind of better known as a sax player than anything else but it's really one of the last that i came to so i started on piano. well that's partly because you you play two saxes at the same time don't you a la roland kirk i mean yeah. on the on the poly harvey tour you were doing quite a bit of that i mean that's that's a, how complicated is that for god's sake um <laughs> you know that thing where you're sort of patting your head uh, rubbing your stomach yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit like that especially because they're both in different keys the alto and the tenor. So, so one's in E flat, one's in B flat. So if you push the same keys down, they sound different notes. So you have to kind of work out where the harmony is going. Agonizingly complicated. Um, so terribly sorry. Uh, yeah. But um, no, that was at Gantz Hill Odeon. And, oh, uh, Gantz Hill Odeon. I saw, saw the Ian Dewar the Blockheads there twice. And I think, so it would have been one of the occasions when the floor went through at the front. Everyone was jumping so much, sprung dance floor sort of thing. <laughs> and, oh, it actually broke. Uh, yeah. And there is um, Ian Horn, who's the uh, sound man who did the, went on to do Madness's sound. He'd actually recorded it on the cassette, this whole gig. And it, it turned up some years later and um, was released on a CD. Oh, really? And, uh, uh, and erroneously has put as Ilford. Odeon, but um, uh, right. well, yeah. it's like it's like well, Bob Dylan, it. the Albert Hall, isn't it? Wasn't it the Albert Hall? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, what year are we talking about then? We're what year? Talking seven. I saw, saw him in seventy eight and seventy nine. Um, okay, so it's do it yourself tour that kind it, of exactly. Thing. Yes. Yeah, I saw tour. that tour. I saw that sh tour at Sheffield City Hall. It was one of the best gigs I've ever seen in my life. I saw them too, supporting the Clash. It's what an incredible Just, band. They were amazing. And, yeah. and then I've gone on to, to play with them in later years. That's right. Um, right, of course. Which is just such a delight. It's funny, when I, I was put forward for it by Lee Harris, and I knew Dylan Howe as well. So that, Right, yes. Yeah. Said, Are you able to dep, you know, when Gilad can't make the gigs? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, I'd love to. And, uh, and Johnny Turnbull said, you, you can play two at once, can't you? I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> when... <laughs> <laughs> they went learned. <laughs> I, I, I tried it before and I did manage to sort of get some noises out of two saxophones, but I'd not really perfected it. So I <clears throat> I just got, got some DVDs of Davey playing and watched what he did in these different things. Of course, bless him, he sometimes played with the alto in the left hand and the tenor in the right, and sometimes the other way around. So right, right. Just to confuse you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, fantastic. What, what else he what got What else there? you got there? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, um, this is, uh, you're going to ask me what year this is and I won't be able to remember, sometime in the 90s. 
but you might be able to work it out from the other bands that were on the waterfront in Norwich. I went to Norwich right. University. Yep. Yeah. Um, but this was Terry Edwards and the Scapegoats, and there's a week of gigs, and that will tell you. Wedding present stereo lab. Oh, Elastica. Elastica. Okay, would well, this be about ninety one, something like that? I guess. Oh, it, yeah. it was later. It would have been a bit later. All oh, right. Yeah. Killing joke. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there you go. What's the unknown? And you started at Norwich. You came back to Norwich. You were in the Hicksons, weren't you, for for a few years? Indeed. Yes. With Charlie 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 Hickson, who, who, who then was simply known as Switch. He was. Yes. What do you remember of him briefly? What, what, what was? Uh, did you get any indications that he was going to be turn out to be the? Uh, the comedian writer etc that he that he did writer for sure yeah because he was doing um english and american studies and he did write a novel complete novel while while there at university which i think he threw away <laughs> um but he made himself get to the end of it and you just yeah. he's, got, he's got quite a work ethic charlie yeah. you know it's very yeah. good very good drawer as well he did all the first um higson sleeves all the all those cartoons and everything under the pseudonym Rene Parapap. That was, all, that was all Charlie. Charlie did all of those. Oh, so, right. <clears throat> you, you knew that he was going to be doing something. Yeah, he, he, for sure. So what do you study at university? Unbelievably music. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> It doesn't always follow, does it? It doesn't, no. I was the only music student in the in the Higsons. In fact, there was a very large music intake in the year I was there for the department. It was 18 of us. Right. It was usually about two-thirds of that. Right. <laughs> so right. it was a very small department, but very interesting. And there was a guy called Dennis Smalley, who was the um, composition lecturer, and I took composition as a main study. He, he was an electroacoustic um writer so it was less dots and more noises and we had a kind of a setup that was really similar to what the radiophonic workshop would have been pre-digital so it was all um tapes quarter inch tapes and things and i learned learned my trade of editing and things instead right. of the screen literally with the with the blade and cutting and sellotaping bits of tape together uh -huh. so that was um the one or two things i've i've put out that from those days on various compilations it's quite just an interesting time, an interesting way of thinking as well. It just makes you not think in that compositional way of sitting at the piano and hoping that a new harmony that no one else has ever thought of comes to you. And instead you can just run a tape backwards or through something, through some weird things, which took a long time back in those days. Yeah. <laughs> now you can sure, yeah. press a button and make things. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now you had to kind of work it out and, and almost set, set things rolling like, dominoes toppling over sort of so I, I set that tape recorder then and with the stopwatch and then I run over there and set that one and then make it all mix itself you know rather than have um multi-track recording so it was quite labor intensive but um an interesting way to compose so yeah. that, was my, that, that was my um also you know you did study J.S. Bark and things like that yeah oh him so, so what what what, what have you, you got? have you been using your time over the last six months? Have you have you learned anything new or uh, you know what have um, you been doing? I've done some remote recording sessions because I do have a little recording set up at home, a Pro Tools set up, so I've been able to do some overdubs and things for, for people. Right. Um, so there's that. Oh, um, so actual actual kind of session work hmm. from home effectively. Yeah. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like, so um, they just send you the tracks and you add your you bit. add your part. Yeah. You're not doing it live or anything like that. No, no. Um, yeah. I've got two to do over this weekend, actually. But <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Who are they James with? Stevenson. It's James Stevenson, the guitarist who um, was in Chelsea originally. And oh, right, yeah. With Holy Holy. Um, God, there's so many, so <coughs> many people you've played with. Uh, so so what you, that kind of work is still happening for people is it it is yeah but what uh, i think the thing is trying to find the audience for it because obviously you can yeah pile a million 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 things up online doesn't necessarily mean anyone's going to listen to find it. them no, sure. i want to go to a gig you know <laughs> no, absolutely. To go to a gig both players and followers and and you know and buy a t-shirt and the new record or whatever it is yeah 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 not just get things thrown at you through your through your laptop yeah yeah what else you got there terry 
now let me see we talked about the Higsons um, I have a little eBay search up for Higsons things because I just wanted to make sure that I got everything and which can be a good and bad thing you know like those things that you shouldn't read the comments oh, yeah. underneath it yeah yeah so anyway I got um, a set list a Higson uh, set list oh which uh, God knows why anyone kept this but uh, they did and it's it's actually around two tone time because tear it down was tear the whole thing down which was on two tone yeah um, I'm doing this in mirror writing. Let me go down a bit. Uh, Ylang Ylang was the B side of that, which yep. was Jerry Dammers produced those two tracks. And then Run Me Down was our second two tone single. So that specifically makes it kind of early 83, I think. So you found this on eBay? Yeah, this was on eBay. I know so you had to buy it back. You had to buy back your own, which you yourself probably discarded, it's probably taped to your amp. <laughs> Who wrote it in the first place? You um, or I what? asked Simon, drummer Simon, who I saw the other day, and I showed him, and he, he reckons it's Colin, the <laughs> bass player's writing. Right. Um, the dispiriting thing, as I said, not reading the comments and everything, was my bid for nine, of 99 pence was the only one. <laughs> 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 no one else wants this rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh. I would have thought settlers are the easiest things in the world to fake, aren't they? Because they're all kind of written in that same kind of magic yeah. mark hand, hand, exactly. Hand, you know. The, yeah. I think this is a an ad. Uh, is this a poster for cigarettes? Does that look like a Rothmans thing there? I don't know. Well, it could be. Is that? But anyway, oh, right. on the back of. Uh, oh, it's on the back of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. This would have been on a dressing room wall, a poster yeah. or something. We'd have taken it off, written the yeah. settlers on the back of on stage. That's, oh, it's lovely. And then it ends up however many years later, being sold on eBay to a yeah, member of the band pence. for 99 <laughs> pence. That's absolute. That makes you, God bless the internet, you know, for bringing, for bringing us such miracles. Extraordinary. What else you got there? You'll, you'll probably recognize this album. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Blurs for Life. Fabulous. Blurs for Life. Now, that's yeah. 1977. Yeah. Uh -huh. Nice cheery smile. Yeah. This is... Um, my record store day release which is my very last school photograph from 1977 <laughs> that's great isn't that uh, you know that's just <laughs> that's really good and not intentional of course how could it be <laughs> oh <laughs> nice well they they took your picture at school when you were leaving is that the idea uh, it was the, i think it was the beginning of the last year yeah it was right. the uh, usual, the annual yeah. school photo yeah. and it just so you can't see it now, but on the on the school tie, down the bottom, three safety pins. <laughs> oh, <I see>. of course. <laughs> that off. was your um, that was your little sign. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. A nice bit of punk rock going on there. Um, so yes, that anyway. So that because of the situation we're in, the record store day should have been April. Yeah, yeah, it's all gone by. That's yeah. Not, that's not even, that's not coming out to the end of this month. <laughs> oh. oh, well, oh, well, oh, well. One of those. What else you got there? Okay, um, let's see. I won't do any more shameless self-promotion. Shall I get on to Michael Caine? Go on, Go what on. you got there? Um, you, ca you came to the concert, didn't well, you? Well, I came to the concert, you did a concert in the, I think it was the barber, could blow, your, blow the bloody doors off, was that? Or is there oh, right. music associated with Kane's yeah. films? And I, if I remember rightly, it was, you know, there, there was a, a Sonny Rollins, I think, did the Alfie soundtrack. I think Quincy Jones did the Italian job. John Barry was at the Ipcris file. And uh, there was the Get Carter soundtrack. And you did a kind of yeah. concert celebrating all that music, didn't you? Arranged by yeah. you, you were the, the musical director. Fantastic yeah. show. Yeah. Um, get Carter was Roy Budd. Yes. That's right. Right, right. So um so we did all that and uh so I get Carter. What would Jesus say? And that is that that's a bit that's a picture from Get Carter. That's yeah. a still from yeah, Get so, Carter. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. This is a, another still from Get Carter. Yeah. Film made in 1971, actually, coincidentally. <laughs> <laughs> does, is that date, does that date have some resonance, David? Well, I tell you, you, <laughs> might, you might know this, actually. You, you can tell me more. Roy Budd composed... He, he pretty much did that live, didn't he? The, 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 you can see extraordinary clips on YouTube of him, of him composing the music pretty much 
in the studio. It was it along was, with. Is that right? Go on. <clears throat> it was one of those things that are very typical of um, of the film world, where the film gets made and everything, and then suddenly they go to the composer and say, oh, "Right, well, can you do the soundtrack? We haven't got any money left." Yeah. And I think the I think the budget for the recording of the soundtrack was three hundred and fifty quid or something like that. I might be doing them a disservice. It might have been four hundred. Yeah. It was certainly under a monkey. I'll tell you that. Um, but. He, but he still took the job. I mean, that's uh, yeah. it's noble. And there's another little, yeah. nice little blockheads thing is that both um, Mickey Gallagher and Johnny Turnbull are on the soundtrack singing. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. well, well from, yeah, well, they were from Newcastle, weren't Castle. they? Oh, amazing. That was, that was a connection. Yeah. yeah. I say, you know, the Get Carter soundtrack is still one of my favourites. I absolutely love that, that sound of that. Yeah. yeah. It's Isn't amazing. It? And the, the bass player is Jeff Klein. And the drummer, who also played tabla, was Chris Caran. Yes. Both of them were on the sort of Brit jazz scene. I think both of them played with Dudley Moore. I was going to say, Dudley Chris Caran certainly Chris did. He was certainly the drummer mm. with, du with Dudley Moore. Yes, that would make, that would make sense. Those names crop up on a lot of things. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, the, no, those yeah. names crop up on quite a lot of records. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, even Tony Visconti's uh, worked with them, I think. I saw those names crop up on one of his early... Sort of solo records yeah so, oh yeah and the last one is well um, we tend to tend to end uh, 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 terry with with the greatest uh, record ever made oh have you got sorry, another yeah. picture there go on let's see the picture yeah that that was just the italian job that was oh the, let's uh, see it let's oh see right it. right right lovely oh fabulous can't go wrong can't go wrong yeah 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 well, brilliant, brilliant i might go, I might go away and watch that <laughs> yeah yeah we watch it every Christmas. My theory is it's one of those few uh, uh, multi-generational films that you can watch. Yeah. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves it. You know, the old folks kind of love seeing kind of uh, the doddery old Noel Coward characters and, you know, the, <laughs> the boys love all the cars and it's, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. And there's Michael Caine with the cat on his lap there. And if we were in another room in the house, my cat Scarlet would be sitting there and I'd be looking like Blofeld. Oh, uh, so, that's um, it. Precisely. <laughs> Or The Godfather, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. yes, the greatest, the greatest record ever made. Here it is. Okay, drum roll. Indisputably your choice, yep. Mm -hmm. So whatever you choose no, is no, the right the greatest answer. record ever made. <laughs> All right, okay, it's a Go single. On. Okay, I can't So it's a single. It's, a, it's on Atco, so it's on Atlantic. Okay, are you going to bring it a bit closer? Oh, a bit closer, I still can't see. No, go on. Shout out what that is. You got. To... You don't miss. You don't miss your water by King Curtis. By King oh, okay. Curtis. So wow. is it, it's an instrumental. Record, I don't. Do you know? I don't know that. So what's that? Sixty-five, sixty-six, something. No, probably oh, later. You see, would they have a date on it? It's, yeah. It's not dated, I'm afraid. Oh, um, okay. His version of Green Onions is the other side. Oh, okay. right. So it's an instrumental version of what. Well, was it William Bell wrote that song? It not did. Will it. it did he? Yeah, yeah. It did. Yeah. Very but good it's work though. It's just instrumental. Yes, it is. In fact, I, that's, the, that's the plug side as opposed to Green Onions. That's not the plug side according to the uh, yeah. I must look that up because it's interesting. King Curtis, I'm not aware of him, you know, having any hits kind of at the time, but loads of King Curtis things have turned up over the years, haven't they? Like, uh, it's in With Nail and I, isn't it? Is it White Shade of Pale? Oh, is it? Right, yeah. It, it, his live White Shade of Pale. Which is, is live at the Fillmore, isn't it? We're live at the Fillmore, yes. Mm. Is, uh, is used extensively in, uh, in uh, With Nail and I. Okay. Because Memphis Soul Stew pops up all over the place. Yeah, With Nail and I is all based on the end of the 60s, isn't it? End of the 60s turning into the 70s, I think, isn't it? So you right. get the Jimi Hendrix all on the Watchtower and all that. It's meant to sum up that particular yeah. period of time, I think. Yeah. End of the decade. Yeah. I, well, I, sh I shall... You said that you don't know many um, sort of solo records or hits of his, but I think there's one point where this is obviously um, one of those anecdotal things, but uh, it's, he considered to have played on more million selling records than anyone else because he would be the one brought in to do the eight bar solo absolutely yeah 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 song. and then the next coaster song and then the drifters and then yes, whatever it was he was, he was the go-to man for the sax solo in the middle of all these huge huge hits and he just well, you, you, 
You're talking about, you know, say, playing, um, you know, sessions during lockdown, uh, you know, contributing bits down the line kind of thing. And nowadays, everybody does that. Whereas King Curtis was the first person I heard of do this on John Lennon's Imagine. I think he plays on Imagine, not, not the track Imagine. I can't remember no. which track it is. He is on the album for sure. <laughs> He's on the album. And they basically, they, that record was made in Britain. He was in New York. And they told him what they wanted. And he just taped a load of eight bar fills or whatever, sent them to him, and picked them. Which seemed like a miracle to me in the 1971. Isn't that amazing? That would have been posted, right, in those days? Well, presumably, Absolutely. yeah. Reel to reel in the post. Astonishing. Yeah. So what, they, didn't yeah. send him, they didn't send him the, the, the sort of rough mix for him to play I, along? I, they must have done, I suppose. There must have been. Yeah. But I mean, all of those things in those days were a, a matter of physically getting the tape to somebody, which cannot Absolutely. have been easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's extraordinary. Incredible. I, was, I should go away and look that up because uh, I'm not familiar with that. And I like the idea of the greatest record ever made is something we've never heard. That's, that's entirely <laughs> right. Very good. No, Very, good. I mean, Very I'm original and interesting. It's, no, it's, that, great. it's not being willfully obtuse. I genuinely think that's No, obviously. And that's, <laughs> that's what it's there for. That's absolutely <laughs> what it's there for. Well, Terry, it's been lovely talking to you. What are you looking like, forward to? Well, you told us what you're looking forward to doing when this bloody war is over, which is <laughs> going to a gig or playing a gig, or both. Yes, that would be, that would be nice, yeah. But I, I must admit, I, you know, I could have had it a lot worse, I'm sure. You know, I didn't catch the uh, yeah. virus. No, yeah. true, we, we have to count off. So person. far, so good. Um, yeah. And I'm actually quite used to this way of living, really. If I'm off the road, then I'm at home practicing, doing whatever I'm doing, putting together records and things. Whereas I think that if people don't have, aren't used to that, it's been a very hard few months. Absolutely. Yeah, so, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, lovely to talk to you. Terrific to talk to you. Thanks, Terry, very much. Likewise. And we look forward to yeah, seeing see you, you in, in the world. Very Cheers. good. Absolutely. Bye.